Welcome back to another video this is part 9 of what if Issei was almost killed by Rias Grimori like share and subscribe for more alright let's begin. Chapter 41 Head Pats Scene Kyoto House Kuo Japan Knock 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 Akino stood from the couch and began her way toward the door. Sitting on one of the comfy chairs, an agitated looking riser Fenex scoffs. Don't you have servants for such menial tasks? Immediately, Ravel Fenex rushes toward her brother, proceeding to use a folded up piece of paper to smack the back of her brother's head, quite hard. Baka Oni Sama, don't be such a moron. Penemu was the next to giggle at the scene. Kaniko, who was sitting next to the fallen angel on a couch began to smell the air in short sniffs. I smell, angels. One smells like Irina, but the other is different. Kiba stood from his seat and produced a small dagger using his sacred gear while placing it behind his back. He then placed a small plastic smile across his face as if it were a mask of sorts. Xenovia and Asia both stood up and stood next to Kiba. Gasper, who was dropped off at the home by Grafia, earlier that evening, was looking at each person in the room, nervously, while grasping onto his Kuo Academy skirt using both hands. Another angel, oh no, this could be scary. But I gotta do what Senpei taught me, I gotta be a real man of the Grimori house. No longer shaking, Gasper rushed over toward Kiba, Xenovia and Asia. Kaniko also stood up and walked over toward the group, while standing behind Gasper with both of her arms on the little vampire's shoulders. The door opens as Akino allows the pair of angels into the home. Irina was the first to be seen by the rest of the group. She was wearing a new set of white and gold armor. Smiling as if nothing was out of the ordinary, the brown-haired angel adjusted her halo as it was sloping a bit. Standing behind Irina was the tall and blonde sister Michael, the leader of heaven, Gabriel. Riser immediately busted out laughing while pointing at Gabriel. Ha 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 ha. Riser is surprised to see Hyodo shrimp stalker so soon. Tell Riser something, have you special ordered another dragon boy pillow, or are you satisfied with the well used one I saw earlier? When Gabriel first entered the home, she was smiling warmly, which looked eerily similar to her brother's, however there was a very, almost unnoticeable, grin, under that smile of hers. Not changing her mood or body language, the angel continued alongside Irina into the den area, while sitting down on one of the many available couches, as most inhabitants of the room were currently standing. After both angels sat down, Gabriel then crossed her legs and looked at each person in the room, aside from Riser, as if she was pretending he wasn't even present. Greetings, devils, please, would you direct me to Hyodo, Issei's parents? I have some important questions to ask them. Afterwards, I will be interviewing each and every one of you in this room. Now, as I said earlier, please direct me to Mr. and Ms. Hyodo, now. The angel said this in a very cold and matter-of-fact sort of way. Akino was standing near the hallway which connected to the front door, she had both hands on her hips with a tick mark plastered to the side of her head. Irina, I don't know what is going on in that head of yours, but if you think for one moment, I will just allow you to bring some hussy into this household, making demands on all of us, and assume I will just turn a blind eye. Think again, you, woman, this is not your home and you will not speak to any of us like that, now do you understand me? Akino is now clad in white and red priestess outfit while sporting twin electrical arches from both hands. The entire room was overtaken by the sound of maniacal laughing and thunder crackles. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. We are now inside Yusaka's master bedroom. On the large Japanese style, mad bed, the woman in question was laying on her back, with all nine of her tails spread out taking up the majority of the bed. Laying on the fox's chest was none other than Issei, as he had his arms wrapped around the queen's hips and back. Spooning on each side of Issei was Ophis on one side and Kuroka on the other. From the looks of things, a cuddling session of sorts was happening. Ophis quietly spoke, as her mouth was very close to Issei's left ear. If it would make you feel more at ease, there may be a way, in order for you to get stronger in an accelerated fashion. As you absorb the spiritual energies from all of us and those of this hallowed place, I may be able to create and reinforce a method in which you may physically train. Time would have no meaning as we would need to temporarily relocate to my old home. You call it, the dimensional gap. I call it, silence. I digress, Issei, 
I can produce a pocket dimension in which you can train for two hours. It will be only two hours, here, in this plane of existence, however, inside of said dimension, two hours will seem more like two months. Would that be acceptable, Security Mate Kuhn? Issei lifts his head and looks into Ophis's eyes. You, you do that for me. Why? Ophis places her index finger onto Issei's forehead. She does this while smiling. If you need to ask such things then perhaps you are still recovering from your previous injuries. Issei's jaw drops as he is about to say something about being humbled and feeling grateful, however his mouth is invaded by the tongue of Ophis, the infinite dragon god. A few hours go by, as the four inhabitants continue to talk about a great many things. Issei tells them all about how he actually feels. He continues about how he's been feeling ever since he was killed, why he acted the way he did, under the influence of Rias Grimori, he even told them about his confusion when it came to Sirzex and Grafia. Meanwhile, Kuroka tells Issei about her past, when she was a part of a peerage, before she went stray. After hearing the sad story in which a big sister did anything and everything she could, to save her little sister, Issei couldn't help but hold the pain-stricken Nako against him in a very tight hug. Yusaka listened and was overcome with emotion. Kuroka isn't the monster that the underworld made her out to be. She just wanted to protect her sister, Kaneko, who is in Rias Grimori's peerage. This just got more complicated. It's fine though, look at the two of them, comforting each other's broken hearts. Smiling at the scene with her trademark crescent-shaped expression, the Fox Queen now turned her head toward Ophis, who was sitting on the opposite side of Issei. Ophis seemed to be staring intensely at both Issei and then Kuroka. Tilting her head multiple times, the infinite dragon god looked as though she was attempting to understand and read the situation happening in front of her. Yasaka thought this was rather cute. It reminded her of her daughter. Even though the Ouroboros dragon changed her body into that of a 30-something adult, she still had childish features that experienced parents could pick up on. Who knew that through this boy, I would meet such interesting friends? Well, I suppose I shouldn't call them that any longer. Ophis then looked up at Yusaka as she felt the Fox Queen's warm hand on top of her head, softly patting it. You are a good, good girl, Ophis Chan. Tilting her head once again at the Fox Queen, Ophis actually smiles. Yes, I am a good, good girl. I am Ophis. Nodding, Yusaka continues to smile and give Ophis head pats. Chapter 42, Company, Scene, Hyodo House, Kuo Japan. That's enough, the both of you. Seriously, what kind of parents, raised such bad little girls like the two of you? Just now, Mr. and Ms. Hyodo were scolding both Akino and Gabriel as the two girls were on their knees in a prostrating position. Meanwhile the rest of the peerage can be seen, all with cleaning items such as brooms and dustpans. They look to be cleaning broken drywall from the floor and furniture. As the scene pans out, we can see that the entire hallway looks to be the victim of some sort of attack. Broken picture frames, burned walls, broken siding, it was a disaster area. Mr. Hyodo looked to be a little worse for wear as his bloodshot eyes continued to scan the area, imaging the amounts of money this would all cost to repair. Ms. Hyodo was continuing to berate the subjugated girls who continued to nod with frowns on both of their faces. Irina, who was holding a dust pan, looked over toward Issei's parents and decided to ask some questions, while she had the chance. Say, Mr. and Ms. Hyodo, I have some questions for you, if you don't mind, but it's important, it's about Issei. Both parents turned their attention toward Irina, who now sported a small nervous tick on her head. Well, um, do you know where Issei is? Both parents begin to tilt their heads, then they scan the area, looking firstly at Irina, then the girls on their knees, then the damage to the home. Mr. Hyodo was the first to reply. Wait, was this whole fight thing about Issei? I knew it, damn kid even causes trouble when he ain't even around. Irina loses her natural energetic posture and begins to slump at the news of Issei, not being around. No, Mr. Hyodo, it's not about Issei, well, okay, yes it is, it really is. So if you know anything, please tell me. Everyone in the entire room widens their eyes at this declaration. Ms. Hyodo then shrieks, know anything. What are you talking about? Is my son missing or something? What's going on? That can't be right. We just saw him not too recently, in our bedrooms to boot, so what are you getting at Irina? 
Akino facepalms herself as Gabriel begins to grin. Really? Mr. and Ms. Hyodo, you don't know. Gabriel then rises and points at her own halo while smiling. Realizing that they never noticed before, both parents drop their jaws at the sight as the angel also released all twelve of her white wings. Well, I suppose I shall be the one to tell you everything. I wonder how many times you have had your memories altered up until now. Regardless, I suggest the two of you sit down and prepare for a good deal of life-changing information. Both parents nod as their jaws are being dragged alongside them as they make their way toward the living room. Scene Pocket Dimension, Dimensional Gap Wow, the drag, I haven't had to take a break in weeks now. Aside from some obvious things and small breaks for, essential, things, I have had my balance breaker active this entire time. Add the random boosting, here and there, just for fun and I think I have come to a conclusion, Issei's gauntlet glows green, waiting for a reply. Well, the drag, I think I was meant to have this power for one reason. It's taken me a while to realize it, but I think I got it now. Before, all I would do is protect R, Rias and all of them, without hesitation, because I thought they were, you know, family I guess. Anyway, that's the past. But now, when I see the faces of Yusaka-san, Kuroka-san, little Kuno-chan and Ophis, I feel something different. I always felt at arm's length with the peerage and I never realized it until now. But with them, I don't. I almost feel like I could say or do anything and not be ashamed, isn't that strange? The green glow begins to pulse. Foo 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 foo, ha 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 ha, Issei, partner, you are hilarious. Issei, in his full set of scale mail armor, gains a tick mark on his helmet. No, no, ha ha ha, no, erm, ha ha. Okay, I got that out of my system. Look, so it's obvious ain't it? Issei tilts his head, baka, Issei. You are hopeless. Issei stands up from the ground, looking at his surroundings while shrugging off the odd laughter from his sacred gear. Looking toward the doll house that Ophis prepared for him, Issei decided it was time for a break as he began to walk toward said home. Black and purple were the colors of this strange house. Victorian in nature with gothic twists, this little house looked as if it belonged in a child's bedroom as a toy. The size however was that of a human-sized dwelling. It had all of the amenities that one would need to live which included plumping, heating, food, comfort and entertainment. In the entrance way, a sign could be read, Office 3 Issei. Smiling at the wooden sign, Issei continued into the home and was about to do his usual routine that he has been doing for weeks now, that was until something out of the ordinary was smiling and looking back at him. As Issei was entering his doll-like kitchen area, another person was standing next to the pink oven, while holding a cup of hot tea. Issei was about to say something that is until this red-haired man, who was wearing a grey business suit, opened his mouth, showing off a toothpick. Yo, breast addict, how ya been doin'? Issei widened his eyes in shock and looked a bit taken back. Okay, that first comment, fair enough, totally true, but as far as, how I've been doin'? I don't know you, do I, erm, sir? Looking at this tall guy, who looked to belong to some triad Yakuza gang, Issei's childhood instincts made him instantly feel stressed and worrisome. The man began to laugh very loudly as he looked around the interior of this strange, house. Finally ending his gaze back onto Issei, the man spoke up. Ya no, it's rude to stare and not introduce yourself. This makes it twice now. The first time being back in the underworld. Ya no, when you went all nuclear and shit. Then I kept hearing all of this nonsense about boobs this and boobs that. Finally having enough of it all, I take a peek from the dimensional gap, only to see ya, staring at me like a baka. Aside from being surrounded by questionable individuals, I also noticed my old and disgruntled roommate. Anyway, none of ya introduced themselves and I thought it was rude, so I left. But now, wouldn't ya just know it, here you are, hanging out in a pocket side of my home. And now that I notice it, from the looks of this place and this pocket dimension, you are indeed still hanging out with Doofy Ophis. Why? The man now begins to lean against the breakfast nook while sipping his tea and chewing on his toothpick. Chapter 43, Tattoo, Scene Pocket Dimension, Dimensional Gap, Issei Face Pops, Dedrag, Who in the hell is this chode? Just showing up like this, acting like he owns the place. Seriously, I don't recognize this asshole from any place. 
The drag responded immediately, however he chose to speak out loud, from the gauntlet. Partner, can't you feel his overwhelming aura? Yes, you did, in fact, meet this, per person. Great Red, what is it that you want from my partner? Issei immediately got into a fighting stance, realizing that this, god, was no other than a god dragon, just like Ophis. The now mentioned, Great Red, stood at attention while smirking. After a moment, the man's crimson red eyes widened after he saw what was flickering behind the red dragon emperor in his full-scale mail. Issei's stance changes into the silhouette of a person who was confused as a cartoon sweat drop appeared on the helmet of the team. Being pointed at by a grinning triad-looking delinquent man, Issei didn't understand until he looked behind himself. Then it hit him, partner, that's new, since when did you grow? Another one. The drag seemed very interested as the red gauntlet pulsed with green light. Issei then shrugged, so I got three now. Hmm. As sensei would say, interesting, most interesting. Well, I guess it's cause I am getting all beefy and stuff with this training and all. Makes sense, yeah, the gauntlet began to pulse again. Wow, partner, that was rather well thought out. You didn't freak out this time. Good for you, Issei began to rub the back of his helmet. Thanks, the drag. Issei was drawn out of his thoughts as he noticed that the delinquent was no longer in the kitchen. When did he move? Feeling something tugging onto one of his extremities, Issei once again turned around, only to see said man thoroughly studying one of his tails as he held onto it very tightly. Dude what the fuck, don't touch me. Issei pulled away and proceeded to do a backward jump which left him in the kitchen this time. The man, who was originally kneeling, stood up and looked toward the teen all while beginning to chuckle lightly. Ha ha ha, kid, ya need to chill out, ya feel me. Anyway, since you know my name, I suppose introductions are not needed. Issei decides that he might as well be cordial, releasing his balance breaker, Issei's armor begins to dissipate as he walks toward the Great Red. Extending his hand, Issei smiles. Sorry I never introduced myself earlier. It was a really rough day, that one. Great Red's grin turned into a normal smile. Chewing on his toothpick, the Yakuza-looking dragon accepts Issei's hand as they shake firmly. After the greeting was over with, Great Red looked closely at Issei's face. You have whiskers, ya know. Issei began to touch his own face and to his surprise, Red was right. Three long extensions on each side of Issei's cheeks, these were none other than fox whiskers. Red, then began to chuckle again. So, that's it, explains the smell. Issei then raised one of his arms and smelled the underside. I don't know what you are getting at, dude. Laughing once again, the great red pats Issei on his back. Dragon Fox. Never thought or heard of such a thing, but here you are. Issei's jaw dropped. Dragon Fox, wait, so am I gonna get furry ears and stuff? The drag responds out loud again. Furry ears, whiskers and fluffy tails I would imagine. Ha 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 ha, foo 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 foo, I will have so much ammunition to burn the ever-living crap out of you. Burn after burn, oh yes. What does the Issei say? Boo 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 boobs. Issei scoffed which interrupted the Dre's song. Great Red yawned very loudly. Say, wanna bust out of this joint for a while and have some real fun. Issei was taken back. Wait, what? I can't leave. Ophis, Erm, your roommate, she made this place for me to train. I can't let any of them down by goofing off. Though, maybe after all of this is over, sure, we could hang out. Great Red raised his hand into the air as he began to grin once again, showing his very large canine teeth. Time to have some fun and ya can't say no. Ya can thank me later. Issei was only able to see a very bright crimson light as the environment around him began to disappear. This happened the moment Great Red snapped his finger. Wait, what if they come back and I ain't here? Scene, Sea Tree Mansion. Would you please stop that? You are totally smothering him. I said stop. Momo seemed to be in a mood as the girl had both of her arms around one of Saji's, attempting to pull him away from the blue-haired Tiamat. The blue dragon was in her human form and had a very large blush on her face. Mine, mine, mine. Tiamat felt very adamant regarding her new mate. Meanwhile, Sona and Subaki were watching the scene play out as they both were sipping tea while sitting on a large love cushion. Subaki then spoke up. Whenever the three of you are finished bickering, 
we have some strategies to go through before we leave for the hunt in the morning. Tiamat Sama, since you agreed to help out in the apprehension of the Sekir UT, so as long as Saji agrees to take you on a date, would you kindly tell us what you know about the other dimensions, aside from the obvious ones? Someone of your wisdom should have some knowledge regarding the topic, am I correct in this assumption? Tiamat then pulls Saji back into her, freeing his arm from Momo. As she adjusts the teen as to where she can have both of her arms around him while looking back at Tsubaki with a grin. Not a problem, not a problem at all. Struggling, Saji speaks up. Wait, don't I get a say in all of this? Sona, Tsubaki, Momo and Tiamat, all speak at the same time. No, you don't, seen, who knows. In what looked to be a very smoky and southern style bar, the place seemed to be packed to the rim. On two bar stools, toward the corner of the large establishment, we see Issei in great red, both wearing crimson red business suits with black ties. Still chewing on his toothpick, the great red pats Issei, once again, on his back. See, told ya this place would be fun. The drinks are always on the house and the women, oh Hyodo, the women. Dude, we are gonna have a blast, whether you like it or not. Now, drink up, staring at the glass containing five fingers of single malt scotch whiskey, Issei decided he might as well loosen up a bit. As the two clanked their drink glasses together, they both pounded the drinks and each had a contorted scowl shortly afterwards. This went on for a few hours. Hey, hey, W, W, we, should, karaoke. The, then we should hit up the female college dorms. Ya know, like, earn, get some, ch, ch, chicks. Issei was nodding very truthfully at Great Red's statement. Yes, gray, gray, Great Red, we should, we can peep. The two then high-fived each other and proceeded with their drunken escapades. After another four hours, both guys looked to have gotten their asses kicked. Their matching crimson suits were dirty and ripped. Their faces had matching bruises and welts, as if they got caught doing something they shouldn't have. Laughing together, the two started to walk past a building that had large and bright-colored neon signs, which attracted their attention. Attempting to read the large sign, Great Red proceeded to put on a pair of sunglasses. M, much better, let's see, it says, tat, tat, tattoo. Hyodo, let's get ink. Always wanting a tattoo ever since he was a young child, a now drunken Issei nodded at the chance. Wa, what should we get, Great Red, ha ha ha, dude, I just re, realized, pfft ha ha ha. Great Red turned and looked back at Issei with a grin. And, what would de, that be? Issei nods again. I am drinking, ca, casually with, the, great red. I dunno, dude, sir, whatever, it just kinda, kinda dawned on me. Great red smirked and rolled his eyes. Yeah, whatever, anyway, I got a idea, something really good, you'll see. Trust me, these tattoos will be fucking epic. Chapter 44, gonna get a reaming, ha, ha, ho. Holy shit, this her hurts a lot, a lot more than I thou thought it would. Struggling on a tattoo bed, Issei could be seen, shuddering from pain as the tattoo artist, a tall and pudgy man with tattoos and piercings all over, continued to chuckle. Meanwhile, Red could be seen standing over Issei, watching the work being done, while softly touching his own bare back, which had plastic wrap over his very fresh ink. TCH, that's tender now. Looking back down at Issei's back, Red got a good first-hand look at how his recent work was done. Sekir UT San, dude, you are gonna feel this in the morning, for sure. Maybe the alcohol was wearing off, or perhaps a night of drunken adventures finally took its toll, regardless, Issei finally realized something, something important. Gray Great Red, Issei now has his head upward, looking directly at the stunned-looking delinquent Yakuza Dragon. Dude, we are in the real world earn, wh which means, time. Great Red tiled his head to the side while attempting to understand what the teen was implying. Whatcha mean, kid, Issei would facepalm himself, if it wasn't for the position he was currently in, therefore the teen settled on a simple reply. Two hours, it was supposed to be two hours. Yeah, in the barrier thingy, it would be more like two months, but since I am out, don't you get it? Tilting his head to the other side, Great Red's face now began to produce his infamous toothy grin, once again. Right, 
Yeah, er gonna be in trouble, ya totally are. Yup if I know my roommate, and I do, she will be rather pissy once she returns and doesn't find you. Oh man, to be a fly on the wall when that happens. Wait, maybe I could. Great Red is interrupted as Issei screams out in anger. This is all your fault you know. Since you got me into this mess, you are, hiccup, you are, hiccup. The tattoo artist stopped what he was doing and reached for a small trash can, placing it near Issei's head. Great Red started to laugh as Issei began to relieve his alcohol poisoning in the small trash can. Foo foo foo, hee hee, yeah, okay, I'll make sure ya get home and all. Don't worry kid, haha. Ha. By the way, looks like you are finished, I mean, the tattoo, it looks rad as fuck. After his final gag or two, Issei wiped his face with a towel that was provided by the tattoo artist and looked above him, as a ceiling mirror was placed above him. What looked to be a western-style dragon, with four sets of wings, stands posed behind a circular type of symbol. Looking very similar to that of a communication and or teleportation circle, intricate runes were seen, surrounding the circles as the center revealed a pentacle. The colors were that of black and red. This tattoo took up the majority of Issei's upper and lower back, but to the recovering team, this was epic indeed, Great Red was right, at least about that. Sweet. Seriously, did that is frickin' sweet. But yeah, we need to get back, now. Chuckling and nodding, Great Red raises his hand and proceeds to flick his finger. Scene, pocket dimension. Ophis, where is my husband? You told me that he would be safe. You said two hours. We've been here all night now, looking in nothing. Explain. Yasaka had a no-nonsense attitude as her tails were flickering in the air, violently. Ophis had an indifferent look to her as she began to sniff the air. Seeing the black dragon doing this, Kuroka decided to do the same thing. As the two women began to sniff the air, they both stopped abruptly and looked at each other. Kuroka spoke up first. Yes, something else was here. It smells a bit like... Well, Ophis interrupted as she tilted her head. Baka Baka Red, I should have known, he must have taken Issei away, as a form of revenge. This is unacceptable, Kuroka and Yasaka both had their jaws agape. Ophis began to nod, yes, indeed, I am referring to what you call, Great Red. He is a real Baka, the worst kind. He is loud and obnoxious. He invaded my home. Baka Baka Red will pay for this. Before Yusaka and Kuroka were able to respond to Ophis's declaration, the front door of the pocket home opened. From Issei's point of view, he saw three beauties, all of whom were familiar, standing inside the home, in different states of agitation. From everyone else's point of view, clearly being very hungover, Issei was being steadied by another person. Oddly enough, they were wearing matching outfits, which was strange in its own right. To make matters even stranger, both men had their shirts off and were bare-chested. Kuroka began to smirk and was about to say something in the category of homosexualism, however she was beaten by Ophis. Baka, I knew it, Issei, come here now. The red-headed man, hoisting Issei upward, was grinning. Afi, hey ya, missed ya. The red-headed man proceeded to throw Issei toward Ophis as she caught the hungover team. Ophis was busy looking over a stunned Issei. This allowed Yusaka to say something as she made her way toward Ophis and Issei. Great Red, as in the legendary dragon god. I see. What are your intentions toward my beloved? Kuroka also made her way over toward the group while nodding and waiting for a reply. Great Red simply chewed on his toothpick while grinning. Chapter 45, Siblings. What can I say? I felt sorry for the kid. I mean, Opie, what's up with leaving your so-called mate alone for all this time? Ophis takes her attention off of a now sleeping Issei, as she hoists the passed out teen over her shoulders, she looks back at Great Red with her still, indifferent expression. Baka Baka Red, it is not any of your concern as to how I interact with my Issei mate, now, stop avoiding the question and answer the fox. Leaning against the frame of the door, Red proceeds to turn around while exposing his bare back. After giving the girls a moment to see his new, Accessory, the red dragon turned back around and pointed at a passed out Issei. We got matching ink, cool as shit, right? All three women dropped their jaws and looked toward the unconscious team, as Ophis simply just needed to turn her head considering she had him over her shoulder. Realizing that Great Red was speaking the truth, Yusaka and Kuroka both had their hands touching Issei's bare back, 
very lightly, getting a bit of blood stains on said hands as a result. Kuroka spoke up first. Oh, those symbols, are those really what I think they are? Ignoring the Nako, Yusaka spoke her mind. Why would my love feel the need to deface his own flesh? Yusaka looked very sad as her frown maintained its consistency. Ophis was silent however she looked to be deep in thought. Replying to Kuroka and Yusaka's open questions, Red proceeded to answer. First off, I dunno what you're talking about. Don't you know that these tattoos are, as your hubby or whatever puts it frickin' sweet. Jeez, fox lady, what a buzz kill. And to answer your question, cutie cat, ya betcha, those symbols are what you think they are. Kuroka was nodding and smiling. Fascinating, didn't know you can use those like this. Who would have thought, NYA. Yusaka and Ophis now turn their heads toward the Nekomata. Era, era, what are the two of you talking about? Yusaka seemed to have a change in attitude as she looked more curious than sad. Kuroka was about to explain but was interrupted by Great Red. Oh, it can do plenty. Think of these as a safeguard of sorts. Look, I'll be honest, since Prince Charming over there, is clearly out for the count. I like the kid, liked him since I first saw him. Don't ask me why but he kinda reminds me of this one, um, person, from a long time ago. Anyway, I ain't out to hurt the kid, just wanted to let him get some steam off, ya know, since that thing, with that boob monster, Grimori or whatever. Kuroka seemed to understand as she instantly smiled and spoke up. Oh, I get it, NYA. You wanna be my kitten makers, erm, Issei's bestie, right? Yusaka and Ophis also turned their heads toward the Great Red. Chewing on his toothpick once again, Red responds. Best friends EHH. Sure, don't got a lot of friends. To be honest with ya, everyone is afraid of Matt. Kinda why I hang in the gap. Ophis shouts, so you come to my home. Red frowns. Didn't think ya hated me all. That much. Besides, I wanted to cheer up her emo ass. Always brooding around the place, just nodding in and out of consciousness, it was kinda sad really. I mean, you're a dragon and not just that, or kinda like, well, um, how do I say this? Yusaka was able to see the sibling-like nature in which Great Red was attempting to convey. Her motherly instincts were on point, so she thought to add some clarity to the situation, just in case Ophis prepared for a preemptive strike. Era, Era, if you don't mind, as a mother, I have been able to pick up on a lot of things. The Fox Queen begins to softly rub unconscious Issei's hair while smiling warmly. Sounds to me as if the two of you, are lonely. Dare I say, the two of you are birds of a feather, in a sense. Ophis Chan, I believe that Great Red is offering to be your brother. Era, Era, isn't that just sweet? Kuroka begins to grin. This is gonna be perfect. Great Red immediately looks toward the ground, allowing his red hair to cover his face. Tilting her head to the side, Ophis continues to look back and forth, from Issei to Great Red. Ophis then decides to respond while looking directly at Red. Baka, Baka, Baka. Uncharacteristically, Ophis's eyes were now watery, though she maintained her stoic-like mannerism. Baka. Every time that Ophis spoke her single word, Red seemed to shudder each time, while keeping his head facing the ground. Everyone turned their attention to a now mumbling Issei. B B B B boo, boo, boobs, at first there was just silence. Then, if on cue, the entire room, including Ophis began to chuckle, lightly. Scene, Kuo Academy. In a classroom, which looked to be a third year study hall, we notice a group of girls, all sitting in the back corner of said room. Aika Kuryu, Murayama and Kate seemed to be talking about something in hushed voices. Aika was the one speaking as Murayama and Kates had looks of intrigue. So, if you guys are down, what do you say we meet up at my place, after class? Let's just say I know a lot about what's going on with Hyodo and if you two are really serious about what you said earlier, then we need to talk. Kates looked back at Murayama and the two nodded as they blushed. Right, for now, both of you read this and keep everything to yourselves. When we get to my place, I will explain and no, this is not a joke. Again, both girls nodded. Aika smirked and pulled out a notebook. Remember, say nothing to nobody. Aika then adjusted her pink-rimmed glasses and decided to daydream away the rest of the school day. 
Meanwhile, both kendo club girls began to read the contents of this pink-covered notebook. Opening the first page, both girls read silently, Succubus, an informational guide to lusting. Aika began to quietly chuckle. Thanks for watching like share and subscribe for the next parts one god in my storage.